Well, welcome back to the final week in our series, Chasing Carrots. My name is Dan, and I am a recovering perfectionist. And throughout this series, we've talked about the things that we chase after because we believe they'll bring us some kind of satisfaction or validation in our lives. We're like that hungry donkey chasing hard after that carrot that dangles out in front and can never reach it. We chase after things too. And so we've talked in this series about chasing after the carrots of fame and distraction, possessions, things we all chase after. And even after we're done chasing, as hard as we can go, we're left unsatisfied, wondering, is there more to life than this? And so today we're going to talk about one of the most overlooked carrots, a carrot that some of us even wear as a, as a badge. It's the carrot of perfectionism, perfectionism. And I have never, ever said this before in a message, but the truth is if experience can make you an authority on a topic, then when it comes to perfectionism, I am an expert. Perfectionism is the refusal to accept any standard short of perfection. How do you know if you or someone you love or someone you work with is a perfectionist? Well, you probably already know, but just to help you out, just in case, I found this list Online, I want to share a couple of them with you. You might be a perfectionist if there's no room for mistakes in your world. You might be a perfectionist if you have a very specific manner in which things should be done. You might be a perfectionist if you're really hard on yourself, even for very little things. You might be a perfectionist if you become depressed when you cannot achieve your goals. Or you procrastinate because you can't quite get it just right or you're waiting for the right moment to do it. Or if you think the phrase good enough is a cop-out used by lazy people. You might just be a perfectionist. You want to know how you know you're a perfectionist? Well, if the fact that there's a typo in this slide kept you from listening to everything I just said, you are a perfectionist. Gotcha. You are my people. You are my people. And perfectionism doesn't look the same in all of us. And so the question we have to ask ourselves really is, is why? Why do perfectionists refuse to accept any standard short of perfection? Why do perfectionists need things to be perfect? And here's the thing, and I'm, and I'm sorry to out all of my fellow perfectionists here in the room and watching right now, but perfectionism is not about perfection. Perfectionism is about protection. Protection against the pain of failure and feeling like a failure. See, at its root, perfectionism is not about getting it perfect. It's, it's about fear. Fear of disappointing others, fear of making mistakes, fear of being a mistake. Perfectionism is, is about protection. Protection against pain of failure and feeling like a failure. Perfectionism is, is how we control our world so that we don't get hurt. You see, perfectionism says, I am loved and accepted and valued when I measure up. Therefore, my acceptance is based on my performance. And so I better measure up. The problem is when we don't live up to those unrealistic expectations. And when we don't, we feel these deep feelings of shame and guilt and unworthiness. And here's, here's why I want to talk about this today. See, fear in our lives acts like a fence. It's a fence, right? Fear acts like a boundary keeping us from where we need to go and doing what we need to do. Fear is the extent of how far we can go before we're stopped. And perfectionism is, is fear. Fear of failure, feeling like a failure. And so as an example, just from my own world, this, this is my blog, Empire. Yeah, I started dreaming about it in 2017. This would be a place where people could go for when they're looking for help, practical help on life and leadership, when they wanted to get unstuck. I mean, I had courses I was going to offer and, and uh, events I was going to do, and uh, here's a pro, uh, promotion plan over here and how I would, I would use all these things to really encourage other people in their, in their lives. I even have a growth strategy on here of how this thing was going to build up. I mean, and you might be sitting out there going like, Wait, wait a second, Dan. Like, I, I didn't think you had a blog. And you'd be right. I never built it. I mean, I started a bunch of times. 
I designed the website, I bought the domains, I wrote blog posts, but I never launched the thing. Why? Because I was paralyzed by perfectionism, by all of the fears that come from putting yourself out there and risking it, by all the imperfections that I could see in my own work. Because of perfectionism, it wasn't just work I was called to do, it was another thing that I had to get right or I would be rejected. See, perfectionism says that my acceptance is based on my performance. And if, if I can't keep up with per, this performance level, I'm, I'm not putting myself out there. And so this dream died inside. I never did it. And that's how fear can be your fence. And that's why I want to talk about this today. You have dreams and desires that God has given you. He put them there. And perfectionism, the fear of failure, can keep you from fulfilling them. And some of you are out there today, and you're like, oh, I know a perfectionist, but I'm not one. Woo, your, your life sounds really rough. I'm glad that's not me. Maybe this message isn't for me. And I want to say to you, if fear has ever kept you from doing something important, this message is for you. I think this message is for all of us. Now, the key to courage over this fear is found in a parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. And you can go ahead and get there in your Bible or Bible app. And before we dive in, I'm going to bring you up to speed. See, Jesus is in the middle of explaining to Christians what to do in the time between Jesus leaving and Jesus coming back, the time we find ourselves in today. And so he uses these stories, these parables, to show us how to live. Now, a parable is this fictional story with a spiritual point. So let's look at the parable starting in verse 14, where it says, Again, the kingdom of God, the time we live in now, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability, and then he went on his journey. So here's the setup. Like, with brilliant brevity, Jesus sets the scene. There's four characters. There's one master and three servants. And the story and the language implies that these three servants could be um, gifted or highly skilled artisans or craftsmen or accountants. They were gifted in some way. And so the master's planning to be away for some time, and so he entrusts his wealth to his servants. And here's the first thing we learn for our own story. Everyone is given something. Everyone is given something. Many passages of Scripture make it clear that you are called and you are equipped and you are gifted and you are positioned by God for a purpose. Everyone is given something. And you've been entrusted with many things, almost too many things to count. In fact, I wrote some of those in my notes. Things like you've been entrusted with, with your health and your wealth and your privilege and your position, your vocation, your calling, your perspective, your heritage, your wounds, and your weaknesses, your skills, ambitions, the location you live, relationships, vision, physical makeup, artistry, personality, creativity, and spiritual gifts, just to name a few. Everyone is given something. And that includes you. I don't want you to miss this. There's this part of the Bible where David, yeah, David, the one who took on the giant, he, he's reflecting on how God makes each and every one of us that you were handcrafted and hardwired by the hand of God. In Psalm 139, 14, he says this after thinking about it. I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. He says, God, I, I, I've looked around. I know your works. I've been out in the fields and I've looked up at the stars. I know that you are an unparalleled artist. Have you ever had one of those moments. A moment when the beauty of creation arrests your attention and leaves you awestruck. Maybe for you, you're out camping, or you're on a trip where you're driving through less populated spaces where there isn't much light pollution, and you look up at the stars, and you see, whoa, and you go, wow, God, you made this. You are an artist. God made that masterpiece. Maybe you're driving along this fall and you, and you notice, you say, wow, God, you made that masterpiece. Or you're at the beach and you realize that he made this masterpiece. Or you're looking in the mirror and you realize that he made this masterpiece. Yes, you. You see, that's what David is marveling at. He, he says, I praise you 
because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am one of those great works of art. Fearfully, incredibly, beyond thinking. This is what you have done. I am one of your masterpieces. Guys, you are handcrafted and hardwired by the hand of God. And every single one of us has been given something. And honestly, every time I speak on this subject, people say to me, I don't know what that thing is. Like, I don't know how to discover my calling or my gifting. And so we do want you to know what you have to offer. So here's what we've decided to do. We're going to hold a workshop to help you discover your why, why God made you. It's on a Saturday morning, November 16th, here at the Dixon City campus. There is child care provided. You can sign up at parkerhill.org slash why. And at this workshop, I will equip you with the tools that I've used to help students and parents and people changing careers find their why, the tools that you need. If you've ever wondered how to uncover your calling, find clarity about career changes, or you want to coach someone who's asking these big questions, this workshop will be a big help to you. So you can sign up right now by pulling out your phone and going to parkerhill.org slash why. You see, every one of us is given something. And we can help you identify it. And ultimately, those things that we have been given, they're not ours, not really. They're our masters. It's called, in verse 14, the master's wealth. And even though we all get something, not everyone is given the same thing. Look again. To one, he gave five bags of gold. To another, two bags. And to another, one bag. Each according to his ability. And then he heads on his journey. You see, he doesn't give us the same amount. One with five, one with two, one with one bag. Yes, God's given us all something, but it's but it's not what He has given to everyone else in this room or around you right now. What you have been given is not the same thing, but understand me, it is still significant. Significant. Well, how much were they given? Let's just kind of get the picture here. I mean, he's telling the story for a reason. Well, it's hard to give an exact equivalent in today's money. Scholars, as you read them, wildly vary in in their estimates. But here's what we do know. The amounts were huge. They were huge. We're talking millions and millions of dollars in today's economy. The point Jesus is making is even though they have not all been given the same amount, they have been entrusted with a significant amount and should take it seriously. And that's why comparison is such a distraction for us today. When we say, like, I don't have her personality and I don't have his skills or my classmates' brains, we're missing it. We're missing what we have been given. The whole time you're looking at what you're lacking, you're not leveraging what you have been given. And if you don't use what God has given you, the people around you will be poorer because of it. We all have been given something, but we just don't all have the same thing. And that means you have something to offer. You are valuable. It's interesting, he gives them an amount that matches their ability. This is great news because God will not hold you accountable for her insight or his leadership ability, for her creativity or his handyman skills. No, everyone is given something, not everyone is given the same thing, and God gave you the right thing. Let's see what happens next. Verse 16. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Three servants. The first two go out with excitement and anticipation and notice the phrase, put his money to work. And they end up doubling their money. The last servant, however, goes and digs a hole and buries the treasure. The contrast between these servants is the key, the reason Jesus is telling the story. So let's see what Jesus is trying to teach us. It says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And so he's going to come back and he's going to see how they handled the wealth that he entrusted to them. Verse, Verse 20. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
Then the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. See, the first two reported that they had invested the master's money in some way, and they had, had doubled it. And so both of them are given three things from the master. They give the master's praise. Well done, good and faithful servant. They're given the master's reward. I'll put you in charge of many things. And they're given the master's joy. Come and share your master's happiness. But then the last servant comes. And notice the stark contrast with the first two. Verse 24. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, see, here's what belongs to you. And so the man who buried the bag, he gave it back. He didn't steal anything. He just didn't do anything. And how does the master respond? Verse 26. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew. You knew how this works. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. You know that I work through others to accomplish my goals. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. At least something. You see, the problem is when we do nothing. Listen, you need to understand what the problem is not. The problem is not with skill. He, this last servant, was given an amount that matched his ability. He was given what he could handle. And the problem is not with timing. They had the the same amount of time to work their investment to get a return on it. And the problem's not with knowledge. He knew what was required and what was being asked of him. The problem's not with authority. He was given free reign to invest. The problem is not even really with the return. It's not like he had tried and failed to double it but got something. In fact, the master says, you could have just put it in the bank and got me the minimum interest back. See, the problem is when we do nothing. What was this servant thinking? Well, listen again to the servant's excuse. He says, I was afraid. I was afraid. And I went out and hid your gold in the ground. You know what he's afraid of? Afraid to fail. He's afraid of not doing right or not doing the perfect thing. Afraid of not succeeding. He is afraid to fail. And he is so afraid that he does nothing. And there's a lie that fear tells us. It says, failure hurts so bad that it'd be better to do nothing than to face the potential failure. So protect yourself. But that's not true. As they say, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And you have been given a bag of gold. You've been given so much. Are you sitting on it, afraid to fail? Are you afraid to choose because you might choose wrong? Are you playing it safe because the risk of failure seems too great? If you are, he's saying, think again. That's the message of this parable. Think again. Did you hear the master's response? He replied, you wicked, lazy servant. In essence, you you wasted what I gave you. You wasted it on playing it safe. You failed because you were too afraid to fail. And don't miss this. The servant is not being reprimanded because he didn't double the money. He is reprimanded because he didn't even try. Fear is keeping him from taking action. You see, God is serious about the investment that he has made in us and the responsibility that we have with it. We have been entrusted with significant gifts. And God wants you to know how seriously he takes this. Look how this whole whole parable ends, verse 28. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has been given more, they will have in abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, the man is punished severely for his lack of action. And if I'm honest with you, the person that I identify with most in this story, at least some days, is with the fearful servant, the one who buried the bag, the servant that was too afraid to act. You see, God, he has lots of grace for our insecurities or our lack of faith or even our fear of defeat. 
He's got a lot of grace for it. But there's a problem when we do nothing. We've all been given something. We have not been given the same thing. The problem is when we do nothing. And so as we bring this all together, I, I need your help. I'm, I'm going to put a question on the screen in just a moment. I'm going to want you to turn to someone nearby and tell them the answer. But just let me set the scene. So imagine with me that Publishers Clearinghouse comes knocking on your door and hands you this giant check for $1 million. It's yours. Here's the question. What will you do with a million dollars? Go ahead and tell a neighbor at least one thing that you would do with a million bucks. Go. Yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what you answered, but here's, here's what I do know. You answered something because you would do something, because it would be unthinkable to do nothing with a million dollars. So here's another question. What will you do with your gifts? I hope you would do something because it would be unthinkable for you to do nothing. But honestly, I've been there, and maybe you're there today. Maybe you're in that place where you're hesitating and you're holding back. When I think about what you've been given, I think about a, a check. Like God has written a giant check to all of us. A check with your name on it. No mistake. Written to you. A check that's big. It has got a big fat investment on it. An investment for you. You see, every one of us has, have been, has been given something. And God has given you uh, unique gifts and talents, uh, abilities and passions and opportunities. That's your mix. That's what he has, he has invested in you. And, and God has entrusted you with these specific and significant sets of gifts on purpose. It's not an accident that you're good with numbers. It's an investment. It's not an accident that you can connect with anyone that you walk up to. That's, that's an investment. It's not an accident that you're a gifted athlete. It's an investment. It's not an accident that you are good with money. It's an investment by God. The reason you've been given these things is to make a difference in the kingdom. This is for kingdom impact. And there is no doubt that you have been given something significant to contribute to the cause of Christ. But you know, the thing about checks is that they're only good. You can only access their value if you will sign the back. You see, a check is no good unless you endorse it. In fact, it's just a big piece of paper unless you unlock its value. It doesn't matter how much is on it. It doesn't matter whose name is backing it. Unless you sign it, it's just paper. Only you can void the check, and only you can unlock its value. A check is nothing unless you do something with it. Unless you flip it over and will sign on the back, unless you will cash the check. And I wonder how many of you are afraid to cash the check. Fear of failure, of looking stupid, of not doing it right, is keeping you from cashing it in. Like me, with the blog that never was. You see, this is where perfectionism comes in. Remember, perfectionism is about protection. It's about fear of failure or of being a failure. And you know what? Dreaming about blogging is safer than actually blogging. And volunteering without being asked is scary. It's safer to sit and dream of someone coming and noticing you. Dreaming about being wildly generous is, is easier than actually taking that risk to be sacrificially generous. Dreaming about going back to school or starting a business or changing old habits or meeting the needs of some people in your community is safer than actually doing it. But if you don't actually do anything, the dream dies inside. And the lives that could have been touched, the lives God designed your life to influence would be left untouched and we would all be poorer for it. Let me help you see what I'm saying. Let, let's say that over the course of your life, each of, each of us will meet an average of two to three people per day. And if you were to lead a, a, and live a nice long life, that means you would encounter between 60 to 80,000 people in your life. So let's just say 70,000. 
For perspective, the Eagles play football at Lincoln Financial Field. The stadium here seats 69,176 people. And so imagine you walk into this stadium at the end of your life and you look around and you see this huge space and you see tens of thousands of people. And as you get closer to the stands, you start to pick out some faces, faces of people that you recognize, some you've only met briefly, some you've known most of your life, almost 70,000 people that your life has touched. And every one of them was someone that you had an opportunity to influence, a coworker, a family member, a cashier, a friend. Each interaction was a chance for you to point them in the direction of Christ, to leverage your gifts, to help their good. And the sobering question I have for you is, will you cash the check so that you can help those people, or will you hide your gifts so that 70,000 will not be touched and pointed to Christ because of your fear of messing up? Will you steward the gifts he's given you imperfectly so that people can see Christ in you? And some of you are like, (laughs) Dan, stop. (laughs) You just raised the stakes even higher so that I'm even more afraid of messing up. Takes a lot. You haven't helped me overcome my perfectionism. You just agitated it. And you'd be right. You'd be right. I wanted you to see what's at stake if you live behind that fence of fear. But now I want to talk to you about the one thing, the only thing I think that truly frees you from the fear of failure and of being a a failure. Because remember, perfectionism says I am loved, accepted, and valued when I measure up, which means my acceptance is based on my performance. But the good news is that the gospel turns this on its head. The gospel says before you cared for God at all, he cared for you. Before you loved God, he loved you. Before you could get your act together, God acted. While you were still a sinner and an enemy of God, he loved you enough to die for you. Which means that you were not accepted based on your performance. You were loved based on what Jesus did in your place. An unconditional love like that, unconditional love like that, not because of your performance, breaks the bonds of perfectionism. Not I am loved and accepted and valued because I measure up. When you look at the cross, you realize I am loved, period. You no longer have to fear failure or being a failure. And messing up along the way is not proof that you're a failure. Instead, it's more ways for God to prove his unconditional love and working through imperfect people to do amazing things. And as a result of living from that radical acceptance, we do want to live for God. And so instead of my acceptance is based on my performance, it's flipped around to my performance is based on his acceptance. I don't want to waste what he's given me. So what do we do? Well, two things. The first might surprise you, but you need to try it. Let God love you. Let him. To some of you, this is the most uncomfortable thing in the world. You don't know how to relate to God this way. You come to God, he tells you to do stuff, you try to do it, you mess up, you confess it sometimes, you try to do better next time. No, no, let God love you. For some of you, the idea that your heavenly father is like excited to be around you, likes you, and is proud of you is unthinkable. It makes me think of this networking and leadership tip I was given. I read somewhere that if you're going to introduce someone you know, uh, you know to someone new, you never just share their name and position with that new person. Instead, you share why you value them. So wherever I can, I introduce people by saying things like this. So, you know, Ben's going to meet this this new person. Like, oh, this is Ben. Ben is a guy with deep insights and a a deep love for people. I'm always encouraged by his insightfulness. I think I think you're going to like him. Meet Ben. Or this is Steve. He's always moving things forward, never satisfied with past success. He has a, he's a big reason why this organization is on the right path today. I think you guys are going to hit it off. You see how that works? So let me ask you something. How do you think God would introduce you to someone else? If you cannot hear the excitement and the pride, and the joy in God's voice, it's not his voice. 
And if what you hear is disappointment and frustration and lack of enthusiasm and even boredom, it's not his voice. You know how I think this would go? Garrett, Garrett, you, you got to meet my daughter, Sarah. She's the most beautiful woman in the world. She sacrifices so much to help so many people. Isn't she just radiant? I know it's embarrassing you, but you're amazing. Come on, go ahead. You gotta meet. I mean, she is strong and she is courageous. I mean, I know you two are going to hit it off. Or God saying, Sarah, Sarah, you got you to gotta meet my son, Garrett. Like, he's so talented, the world has yet to see what he can accomplish. Like, like he is strong, and he is courageous. There's no stopping this guy. In fact, I'm just going to sit back and watch him work. Like, this is the most fun I've, all, I've had in eons. You know, I just love this kid. You're going to like him. You should hang out. And he would go on and on and on until you're, like, embarrassed. And he would do it like every time you meet someone new. You, you got to meet my daughter, Sarah. Oh, man, she's amazing. And you'd be like, Dad, you know, like, cut it out, please. You got to let God love you. And this takes sitting still. Radical idea in our culture today, sitting still. You know, like without something in your hands to distract you. And in that moment with God, instead of focusing on your, your performance, your mistakes, your to-do agenda, the, the, the next project, you got to be still and let God love you. Sit there with the Bible and look at a passage like Psalm 139, where it talks about how intricately God designed you and how intimately he knows you and wants a relationship with you. Or Matthew 27, where it shows Jesus dying on the cross because of that radical, unconditional love for you and soak in this total, radical, unconditional love. See, nothing will shatter the grip of perfectionism more than letting God's love define you. Nothing will shatter the grip of perfectionism more than letting God's love define you. So first, let God love you. Second, take one step. See, some of you know what you need to do next, but you haven't done it yet. You knew it before you came into the room, before you listened to this talk. You, you knew it, but you haven't yet taken that action. And you've been feeling God prompting you to do it for a while, but you've been afraid. That fear has been your fence. And so here's my encouragement to you. Take a step. Cash the check. Take a step. For others of you, you don't know what to do. Your next step may be to come to that Find Your Why workshop I talked about earlier. You can cash the check and sign up today. Or for some of you, you know what God has been asking you to do in this season of your life, and you've been doing it. There's, there's hundreds of you here at Parker Hill. That's the only way this place has the impact and touch that it has in this region because of you cashing the check. And so I just want to say to you, thank you, and you need to feel encouraged. We are all the richer because you have cashed the check and taken your step. And so today, as we wrap up, we're going to do it in an awesome way, I think, with communion. And this is a time for us to reflect on the cross and, and let God love us, to warm our hearts and to love him back. And so in a moment, a uh, video is going to play and some buckets are going to be passed down your row. And inside, there are some cups that contain both elements of communion, the bread and the juice. They're all wrapped up together. The wafer of bread on top and the cup of juice underneath. I want you to go ahead and pull one out and hold on to that until your campus pastor can give you some more instructions. And as you do, watch this with me. <laughs> 